Welcome to Conversations with Women in Hollywood. I'm Melissa Silverstein, your host. We talk with the women creatives who are making things happen in the film industry. Women in Hollywood educates, advocates, and agitates for gender equality in Hollywood and the global film industry. For daily updates on what is going on, please read us at blog.womeninhollywood.com. Also make sure to check out our resources at womeninhollywood.com. Please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes. You can also find us on SoundCloud. Is that Myrtle Dunnage? You grew up. You got old. Myrtle Dunnage is back. I haven't seen her since she was a kid. I wonder how she turned out. She's back! Mum, I need you to remember the truth. They say that she killed a boy. So where did she go from here? I worked in London. Milan? In Paris. As a designer. I reckon you came home for one of two things. Revenge or mate. You can transform people. That's very powerful. Use it. Welcome to Conversations with Women in Hollywood. Today's guests are Sue Maslin, the producer of The Dressmaker, and Jocelyn Morehouse the director of The Dressmaker, and also the co-writer. Is that correct, Jocelyn? Yes, it is. So, welcome. Welcome to New York from Thank Australia. You. We Thank love being here in New York, and it's, uh, this is the perfect place, really, to um, have our sort of, you know, red carpet special uh, evening on the eve of the U.S. release for The Dressmaker. Excellent. So, the film opens next Friday, the 23rd, is that correct? Yes. Okay, so we give people a little bit of a head start so that they can know more information about the film so that they can make a good decision about going to see it. So the first thing I want to start with you both is give me your log line of the film and, and, and just also give us your names before you speak. All right, this is Jocelyn Morehouse talking. I'm the director and co-writer of the film. Uh, the way I like to describe it is uh, it's, uh, basically it's unforgiven, but with a sewing machine. Okay. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> that's, that's definitely a keeper. Sue? Um, it, to me, it's kind of like my hometown, and, which is the Ooh. same hometown of the writer of the novel, which uh, the film is based upon. Rosalie Ham wrote the novel, The Dressmaker. And it's like every little small town in the middle of nowhere and then what happens when one of their own comes back after all of those years away and creates ripples when she gets back. And in this case, the wonderful Tilly comes back as a couture seamstress and she's got revenge on her mind and her sewing machine in her hand. So she wreaks havoc in a most delightful way, really. Absolutely. <laughs> and I know that the story of the film starts with you, Sue, and your relationship and how you got in touch with Rosalie and kind of watched this film, watched the book and, and then got the rights to do it. So give us a little sense of how you came to get the story going. Well, the, the crazy thing is I read the book and immediately fell in love with it. And I just love the visual irony of having those gorgeous couture 50s gowns in completely the wrong setting, you know, that Australian outback. And... I got in touch with Rosalie because I recognised the name and yes, we did go to school together but we hadn't seen each other for 30 years. Um, but sadly for me, she'd already optioned it to another producer so I had to wait five years to uh, <laughs> to get that option and then once um, I you know, got that option, um, I, you know, all the way along I knew that I wanted to work with Jocelyn uh, because Jocelyn has a very similar sensibility to Rosalie and that is understanding irony in a very deep way, you know, the intersection of comedy and tragedy and Jocelyn had done it so beautifully all those years ago with proof. Right. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> and Jocelyn, is it true that at the beginning that you were you didn't sign on right away and you had to figure out how to make this happen? Yes, actually, I have to say a sincere thank you to Sue Maslin for never giving up on me because when she first approached me, um, I was still living in Los Angeles. I had moved there um, in 1994 um, because I was making some films in America and my husband is also a director and he was making films uh, in the United States. So we were living our Los Angeles life um, but uh, I have four children and two of them have autism 
which is a really severe uh, developmental disorder. And um, when Sue first, uh, Sue didn't know of this, of course, she just, just knew my films. So when she called me um, and told me about the project, uh, I said, look, it sounds interesting, but I really can't do anything right now because my second, uh, actually he was my third child, Jack, has just been diagnosed with not only autism, but epilepsy as well. And I really have to be a full-time mother for a while uh, because, you know, that's what you do. And so she just kept coming back. I kept, I would suggest other people. <laughs> no, it's nobody else. <laughs> nobody else in my mind. So and I went back. I went back to LA a year later. And said, I'm how's he doing? What do you reckon? Do you think you could come back to work? And uh, by that point, um, I had read the book and fallen in love with Tilly and Molly and also with the concept of these gorgeous 1950s couture dresses in a dusty uh, one-horse town. <laughs> and I realized, oh, my God, I could sort of do a um, sort of a spaghetti western uh, of my own, a, a, a feminine Spaghetti Western, mm -hmm. uh, from a, a female point of view, and I was really hooked. And I think what's so interesting about the characters of Tilly, which is who is played by Kate Winslet, and Molly, who's played by Jude Davis. I mean, like, first he couldn't have cast better people in Jen the whole world, but like <laughs> the characters are really not female characters we see in films very often. Oh no, not at all. No, no, the um, the characters in the dressmaker, the female characters, uh, which are a complex, uh, flawed and fierce women, and I, of course, as a as a director, that's just just incredibly exciting for me to be able to cast not one, not two, but a number of strong female characters, uh, uh, and they're all the the main, they're the leads. Right. And the men are the supporting roles. Right. Of course, they're, they're really great. You know, I got to have Hugo Weaving and Liam Hemsworth, both uh, gorgeous guys and beautiful actors. And so uh, I'm very happy to work with these strong, amazing women. So, Sue, one of the things that I experience when um, I go around the world and talk with folks is the value of male actors versus female actors. Kate Winslet is the, you know, top of the heap, yet she's a woman. And so foreign sales buyers, et cetera, people really want to have a male lead or co-lead that can lend some sort of value in this most absurd way. So is that something that you experienced with this film in terms of, you know, getting the budget that you needed? Well, this was the crazy thing. The film is called The Dressmaker. It's very squarely skewed towards women. It celebrates female pleasure, you know, in, in fashion, in... And um, female empowerment. Fe female empowerment, yeah. female revenge. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's seen through the eyes of women. Yet, even with Kate Winslet and Judy Davis attached... I was told by the sales agent that would not be enough to make the sales that we needed to make worldwide. We had to cast an A-list um, male actor, which I just could not believe. But this is how the market operates. It's, it's frustrating for everyone, but I, I don't see that we actually have an example as so stark as this one. Well, we, we were very fortunate in the sense that uh, in casting Liam Hemsworth, that, you know, as a, you know, a rising star that he was, and, you know, at the time he was in the middle of um, the Hunger Games franchise, he, he was just about to shoot Independence Day. This was a really, really big deal to ask him to come back to Australia and shoot a small, you know, by his standards, um, a small mm. independent Australian film. And I think it's a real tribute to um, to Liam that um, he looked at that character of Teddy and uh, he grabbed that, that opportunity and the opportunity to work with two of the greatest actresses of our time. Right, right. No, I think that the actors themselves don't... <laughs> don't have the same issues that the people who sell no. the movies do. No, they don't. Your film was just incredibly successful in Australia. Um, yeah, it just it went through the roof. It became one of the all-time biggest uh, box office hits in Australia ever. So we're talking about the scale of Crocodile Dundee and Mad Max and Babe. Like, you know, the dressmaker's right up there in, the, in, that, in that Priscilla 
So uh, it went way beyond everybody's expectation. I, I know I was always convinced that there would be um, a commercial audience amongst women because I, like all of us, we know as women we go to the movies and we don't just go alone. We take we go with our girlfriends or and we uh, go a couple of times. Yeah, we go back again or we go with our kids or well, our because husband, we want to wife. share the experience. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So we were very fortunate that we teamed up with Universal Pictures in Australia because they too agreed. In fact, they were the only distributor that I could have a serious conversation about women as a commercial demographic. And they, of course, have done everything from Mamma Mia, Bridesmaids, Fifty Shades of Grey, because they know that women go to the movies. Jocelyn, talk a little bit about creating the look of the film, because one of the things that I found extraordinary was the colours and Mm. just the costumes and I, I read all the notes and all the different people who went into it. And I mean, I, the the story about the, um, I don't know, remember which costume designer, but she had that red material yeah. for that dress, like for 30 years. Yes. Oh no, that was Margot Wilson. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. She's like, I've been waiting to use this. Yes. Yeah, she'd been waiting. Uh, yeah. A long time. She'd bought this. Um, was it, what was it? Red silk Moya. Silk Moya, red silk Moya, um, and she'd always she'd worked on a number of movies, but she'd never felt any of these movies really deserved to have this piece of fabric. And luckily, she fell in love with the dressmaker, and uh, decided she would finally, finally uh, give up this this fabric to make the gorgeous red dress that uh, Kate's character wears to disrupt the football championship in the small town. That she does. Yeah. Um, and other comments that you have about creating this look of the film, which is so well, it was beautiful. very important to me that it was a, it was just luscious visually, mm-hmm. um, because even though the story is a is, is a fabulous emotional uh, roller coaster, actually, it, you know, you laugh, you cry, uh, you laugh again. <laughs> uh, I wanted it to have a strong visual impact. Because I needed to let the audience understand pretty early on that it's a fable. It's not a realistic movie, although it tells many truths. It is, uh, I want them to feel like they're in a, a bit of a fable, uh, a slightly heightened. And so I had to find, I had to make the, uh, the town in the film look a little bit unreal. Mm-hmm. And so I drew my inspiration from Sergio Leone, uh, the Westerns which aren't real Westerns, they're, uh, they're a mad Italian's take on Westerns. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, if the Italian could do it, I can do it too, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and so I shared my enthusiasm for uh, spaghetti Westerns with my cinematographer, Don McAlpine, and also with my production designer, Roger Ford. They're both brilliant, and um, I had worked with them before. And they got terribly excited, and we shared lots of images and covered the walls of my house with various Western images. I was also a little influenced by A Bad Day at Black Rock as well mm-hmm. because I love the idea that this, this stranger comes into town and the, in, the entire population of this small town are immediately threatened by, mm. by the arrival of this stranger. And so I took inspiration from that and uh, based the town a little bit on, on that town as well. So if, if there's any film buffs out there and they... Um, They've seen these films. They'll recognize the uh, the influences. Fascinating. The film was a huge hit in Australia, and now it's about to come out in America. So talk a little bit about how, what is the appeal for this film, which is so Australian, to Americans. Like, what, what can we gravitate to? In many ways, and Jocelyn's is quite right, you know, it's a homage to the great art of American cinema. You know, the genres range in, in the dressmaker range from the femme fatale Oh, of, yeah. you know, Tilly Dunnage arriving, you know, back in this town. And a little bit of film noir mixed mm. with uh, spaghetti western. Mm. So you, what you're seeing is my absolute love of films and my love of filmmaking. Um, you know, it had been 18 years since I had directed anything. And uh, I wasn't sure if I'd ever get to direct anything else. And I thought, well, here's my chance. Uh, Sue Maslin has uh, given me a chance to make a movie and I, I want to make this the most fun, uh, pleasurable film I can do and I'm going to have a ball doing it. 
And I think you can tell that we all had a great time doing it. And I think, you know, American audiences will really love the, um, you know, the playfulness with the fashion because the whole story is one of transformation. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the town, which are all a bit dusty and, you know, insipid looking under Tilly's, you know, brilliant um, skills as a couture seamstress are transformed into these kind of exotic birds. So just the sheer celebration of gorgeous vintage uh, uh, dressmaking is uh, that that's something that particularly women will get a huge amount of pleasure but the other thing is that it's fun it's there's a camp sensibility that sits underneath it all that's about excess and it's just a sheer celebration really of um, pleasure but there is some darkness in there too yeah and uh, and I think what's very powerful about the story is the uh, the fact that underneath all this fun there is the tale of a little girl who was mistreated when she yeah. was younger and and who uh, was separated from her mother at a very young age and so she actually by coming back to this town she finds her mother again mm -hmm. and that is the emotional heart of the film is the is and the chemistry between Kate Winslet and Judy Davis is just beautiful and stunning have right? they worked together before no this is the first time they've ever been on screen before yeah and I was just so thrilled that I got to be the one that, that united them yeah. and um, had them together on screen. So I met you both this summer when I was in Australia and Melbourne to participate in the Natalie Miller Fellowship uh, lecture. It supports women leaders in a film in Australia. So Sue, why don't you talk a little bit about the fellowship and what it does and why you're involved in it? Well, one of the things I do in my spare time is that I'm president of the Natalie Miller Fellowship. And it's really about recognising and nurturing the next generation of women leaders in the Australian screen industry because we recognise that sitting around the table deciding week in, week out what we see on our screens, whether it's in cinema or it's in te on television, online, women are not present and in key leadership roles determining our culture, our screen culture and, you know, who gets to make the movies and what those movies are about. We have an insane situation in Australia where year in, year out, it has not changed for 30 years, that there's less than a quarter of all films that have a female protagonist, that have stories, you know, driven by women. It's crazy. You know, we have uh, less than 16% of all directors are women. It's slightly better than your situation here in the States. Anyway, the Natalie Miller Fellowship is named in honour of Natalie Miller, who's the only woman dis uh, exhibitor. Uh, and one of the few female distributors in Australia who's been an inspiration um, to the whole industry. And, in fact, she discovered Jocelyn in her first yeah, movie. She was, she was a very uh, important mentor to me when I was um, trying to get my first movie up and going. Mm -hmm. And she guided me uh, into actually getting that movie. That was Proof, my first film. Right which also was just restored at the Melbourne International Film Festival, right? Yes, it was. It, uh, it, was, um, it was crowdfunded, actually, to, to be restored and preserved. And wow, that, I didn't know that. Yeah, so I, it was just an incredibly um, emotional time for me, actually, my first film. And uh, it was done on celluloid, and so therefore it was uh, in danger of basically corroding it already had started horrifyingly enough wow. uh, they had to fix quite a big section of the negative and it was only 25 years old so it may, really makes you think about celluloid and how fragile it is seriously but you talked about how you hadn't directed for 18 years because you were taking care of your children which amazing but also i you talked about you also worked on second unit stuff with your husband. Oh, yeah. You were completely I mean, out, right? Yeah, I wasn't completely absent from the film industry, just as a director. Because when you're a director, or this is the way I see directing, uh, I have to love my films as much as uh, possibly I love my kids. Mm -hmm. So um, it's important to me that I can be absolutely obsessively committed um, and to the film. But as I had such fragile children, I couldn't possibly do that. So I had to make a choice. Right. And, of course, I'm going to choose my darling children. Uh, but I would still, I still produced. I, I produced PJ's, uh, quite a, a couple of PJ's movies. And I uh, also um, wrote, tried to get a couple of projects going, you know. So um, 
I, it's not like I was completely gone. And and yes, I would do second unit on his films uh, to help him out on really busy days. And he did the same for me on The Dressmaker. He actually exactly. directed a couple of scenes. Well, that's a wonderful partnership. And I think, Sue, it's just a testament to you because, I mean, in America, a person who hasn't had a credit in the directing field for 18 years, I think it would be really hard. And so I'm just so happy that this happened. No, well, I believed in Jocelyn. And when you see great work, and it was fascinating because I watched Proof again 25 years later, um, you know, this July, and, you know, I was just astounded again by what an accomplished piece of work it is. It stands up every bit today as it did, you know, 25 years ago um, as a very sort of complex, funny, sad movie. And in my mind, you know, you, you, it's the most important decision you can make as a producer is who are you going to ask to, to write the screenplay and direct the movie? And that all comes down to, you know, sensibility. And I saw that in Joss and believed in it. Absolutely. Still do. And we're doing, we're going to do more work together. Oh, yeah, we've got another project. That's fantastic. So I have just a couple more questions. What advice do you have for other female filmmakers, both of you? Support each other. <laughs> uh, don't wait for a man to discover you. Uh, that's not, just not going to happen. Um, women producers are way more likely to uh, mentor and uh, hire women directors. And um, that's been my experience. And I think we really have to help each other. You know, I'm taking it very seriously. I have a, I have a few young women uh, up-and-coming short film directors that I am seriously mentoring because I believe in their talent and I know they need a mentor. And uh, I know Sue is, uh, does the same thing. And, and I just really believe in the power of the audience and the power of women wanting to see on screens complex, interesting um, female characters, really, that uh, say something about the way that we live our lives. And we get this tiny, tiny spectrum that's filtered through popular mainstream culture. There's so many more stories out to be told. So from a producing point of view, um, there, it's just connecting, you know, great stories about women with women audiences and convincing the market that they can, you know, make a dollar selling movie tickets. Last question. There's been some movement in Australia from the funding bodies bodies to include more women directors and women's projects in their funding so I wanted to get your your thoughts on is Australia on the right track to increase the amount of opportunities for women storytellers I think Australia is on the right track of saying the current situation has to stop. It's got to change and something radical needs to be done to kickstart it. So what the Australian funding bodies have done is said, look, we're not going to introduce quotas. We're not going to hit people over the head. But what we are going to do is put our money where our mouth is. They opened up a $5 million fund that took away all of the barriers, um, you know, the existing barriers where women couldn't apply if they hadn't made, you know, a film within the last 10 years or they didn't have sufficient credits. They got rid of all of that, just said, come to us with your development ideas, whatever they are, and um, did an open call. Hundreds of uh, applications came through and they have selected this incredible um, range of genres and discovered new talent. And we'll see where it goes. Like, you know, the proof really will be in the next three to five years. For everybody, The Dressmaker, starring Kate Winslet, Judy Davis, produced by Sue Maslin, directed and written by Jocelyn Morehouse, opens in the United States on September 23rd. Thank you both so much for taking the time. Thank you, Melissa. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you for listening to Conversations with Women in Hollywood. For more podcasts and daily updates, please go to blog.womeninhollywood.com. For resources... To subscribe to our weekly newsletter and to help support the work of women in Hollywood, please go to our website, womenandhollywood.com. Thank you. This podcast is produced by Adam Shartoff. Music is by Laura Karpman.